Good morning, my friend, and welcome to what must surely be the strangest top 10 we visited so far. Welcome to the dark night of the week, ending August 3rd, 1973. At number 10 this week is Maureen McGovern with the big ballad from the Poseidon adventure, The Morning After. McGovern managed to top even this wimp fest with the theme to an even more disastrous movie in 1974, The Towering Inferno, establishing herself as the premier artist in an extremely niche market, the disaster movie love ballad demographic. At least Shirley Bassey had Bond films. Shirley Bassey? Hold that thought. Number nine, Don McLean is widely reputed to be a rather unpleasant fellow. No matter how horrid he might be though, he'll only be the second most horrid person on this week's list. But again, hold that thought. Here he is with If We Try, a simplistic little song that clearly means to offend nor overexcite no one, and furthermore, as if it was written in about 15 minutes. It spent a few more weeks in the top 10, creeping as high as number 8, before either deciding that the rarefied air at that end of the chart was all too heady, or that the marketplace simply decided the record was boring and dull, and either way, it sunk like a stone. At number eight, it's the Burger King himself, Elvis Presley, with You Gave Me a Mountain, a thick, down-home helping of steaming pseudo-religiosity and over-emotive vocal. The blue-haired nonnas and the over-sentimental moms lapped it up as they always did, but time was running out for Ole, both figuratively and literally. He still had five more top 40 hits in him, but only Moody Blue was any good amongst them. His odious manager, Colonel Parker, saw the writing on the wall with his grifter's eye for a main chance, and in 1974 sold all of Elvis's future royalties back to RCA for $400,000, or about $2.2 million in today's money. Contemplate that. Those royalties are worth $15 million a year to Elvis' estate today, 46 years after he died. The Colonel's half of the money went towards paying back a fraction of the gambling debts he had at the International Hotel in Las Vegas. Elvis played 636 shows at the International. His residency no doubt extended principally to remove the necessity of the Colonel's starting up a new tab at another hotel. Where's Joe Pesci and his friends when you need him? Number seven, more wimp rockery. Are we seeing a trend this week from someone whom we once might have thought knew better? Paul McCartney and this particular week's model of wings with My Love. It's a boring song from a bewildering album, lacking much McCartney melodic invention, which it seems to make up for in his treatly and mawkish sentimentality. At number six, there's the only record in this week's top 10 that might pass for a rock and roll record, but what a royal pain in the ass it is. It's Hello, Hello by Gary Glitter, and I may or may not have a problem with it. I think any reasonably educated in these matters audiences would know that Paul Gadd, the man behind Gary Glitter, is a slavering gangrenous vampire who's monstrously preyed on children for many years. He's in prison for it at the moment. So, a thoroughgoing bounder, and certainly one best left forgotten to rot and endure whatever depredations are handed out to prison nonces these days. Having said that, as a lifelong glam rock tragic, I grew up on a box of Gary Glitter singles, and these records have residence, they have emotional weight with me. They were significant comfort through unhappy times and unhappy places. I talk to my kids about this. They make the point that Gary Glitter is the name a man uses while doing a job, like, say, Alice Cooper, and that Paul Gadd is the abomination who leveraged the name of Gary Glitter to satisfy his depraved and reprehensible desires. Maybe they just understand Hegelian dialectics better than I do, because I still find it difficult, and therefore seldom do ever, listen to his records. Well, time to find who's fit as a fiddle and frisky as we forge towards the font of fulfilment with Fowl's fantastic world of facts. The biggest rise of this week is Helen Reddy with her undoubtedly in the theme of the week pseudo-country, pseudo-gospel gobbledygook, Delta Dawn. I have no idea what this song is about. Perhaps you can tell me. I have no idea what Helen Reddy's twangy Oklahoma accent is all about either, but that's neither here nor there. Anyway, six places it rose, a whole six from 20 to 14. 
Falling out of the charts this week is the aforementioned Gary Glitter, whose Do You Wanna Touch Me? Ooh, no thanks. Fell from 11 to 21. This week's top debutante was the great Billy Thorpe and the Aztecs with their hard rockin' movie queen, which leapt in at number 36. And one spot higher at 35 was the longest lasting record on the charts, Roberta Flack's Killing Me Softly, which had graced the charts for 22 weeks at this point, having spent four of those weeks at the very pinnacle. El Supremo in Estados Unidos is The Morning After by Maureen McGovern, who was one of 14 acts to have their first number one hit in 1973. Jim Croce, and I may not have pronounced that correctly, later in the year became the third act to hit number one posthumously after Janis Joplin and the great, great, great Otis Redding. This, of course, is no longer such a noteworthy accomplishment given that so many rappers are now getting capped and going to number one in memoriam. I'm making the ironic inverted commas with the fingers gesture at this point. It's become positively commonplace. This is no diss on my homie Biggie Smalls who had two posthumous number ones. In this hood, we be rolling with the Biggie. In the UK, the man we simply cannot avoid this week, Gary Glitter, ruled supreme with I'm the leader of the gang I am. In my hometown, the mighty hot August nights ruled the album charts. The album that makes my kids say to me, What happened to you, Dad? You used to be cool. It's not only the greatest album ever in a genuinely hideous album cover, it also spent 29 weeks at number one. It was still in the top 20 in 1976, and it made the top 20 again right across the early 90s. What more is there to be said about Hot August Night? I'm sure I've told this story before, but in 1974, when No Fault Divorce was introduced in Australia, the second most contended item in divorces was, after the family home, the domestic copy of Hot August Night. The children of the marriage were third. Let's get back to the top five, which we commence with Judd Strunk's A Daisy A Day. I instantly both regret and lament this choice, to go back to the top five. Strunk apparently was more famous as an author of humorous songs and with a name like that you'd think there was some kind of nominative determinism at play, but hit big with this steaming hot pile of lacrimose pudding. Sadly, Strunk died after having a heart attack at the controls of his private plane, an accident which also killed his best friend. He was only 45. At number four, after an unbelievable nine weeks at number one, it's our old nemesis Tony Orlando and Dawn with tie a yellow ribbon round the old oak tree. This song has an interesting origin. One of its co-authors, L. Russell Brown, a songwriter who wrote hits in just about every genre for every singer imaginable, read a story in a Reader's Digest about a Civil War POW who was coming home from Pennsylvania from Andersonville prison camp and he'd written to his sweetie that if he should just keep on rolling on that stage he'd understand but if she wanted him to stay tie a yellow handkerchief on the tree in the lane change handkerchief to ribbon and they had the biggest selling single of the year his popularity was perfectly understandable as both American and Australian troops began to come home after the Vietnam War and I guess it served as a cultural landmark of some significance. And it does fit the oldies review theme for this week's top 10. 3. It's hard to be too critical of the occupant at number 3, Cole Joy, who is enjoying his biggest hit ever with the countrified Heaven Is My Woman's Love. There isn't much in Australian music that Cole Joy hasn't done. He was the first rock and roll number one hit in Australia, he gave the Bee Gees their big break, and he survived a 20 foot fall out of a tree squarely onto his head while helping out a neighbour. This was the first chart entry in many years, he still managed a couple after it, one almost making the top 50. He's still with us, still utterly irrepressible and still considered a top bloke by what would have been my parents' generation. The early 70s was the golden age for a musical style called Contrapolitan. Contrapolitan evolved from what was known as the Nashville sound as the audience for country music gradually suburbanized and began to cross over with pop music. 
country records dropped the key elements of honky tonk, the fiddle and the steel guitar, and began to use backing choruses, more baritone male leads, and slower tempos. Countrypolitan began to adjust the format by adopting a more regular pop music song structure. So the rural and small town listeners tended to gravitate towards the Bakersfield sound with Buck Owens, Merle Haggard and Furman Husky, and the upwardly mobile rubes and black folks who accounted for 30% of country music sales, went across to the slicker sounds. By 1961, the basic template for the new pop-oriented countropolitan sound had been laid down by one of Nashville's great producers, Owen Bradley, and one of Nashville's greatest ever, if not the greatest ever singer, Patsy Cline, with a disc called I Fall to Pieces. Klein was the perfect vehicle for the new style because she was every bit as fine an adult pop singer as she was a country singer. When asked to define the sound of country politan, cheeky Chet Atkins, the legendary guitarist, put his hand in his pocket, jangled some coins and said, that's it, the sound of money. Country Pollitan retained the strings and choruses, often using full orchestration, and Floyd Kramer's slip note piano style. Kramer was, however, such a versatile scamp, he could, wouldn't, frequently did play anything that took his mind to play. And as the 60s rolled on, spearheaded by super producer Billy Sherrill's stable of stars, it absorbed all before it. One of the key talents discovered by Sherrill was Tammy Wynette, whom he turned from a rough and tumble country singer in the mold of Loretti Lynn to the queen of country pollen. One of her biggest hits was I Don't Want to Play House, which in 1968 won her a Grammy. Barbara Ray was a weak-voiced Scottish singer who travelled abroad to find fame and fortune, issued a few middling singles, and finally had her one and only hit with a song that, if you're going to try and milk it for all the overawed emotion you can, you need a big voice. You need a Patsy Cline voice, not a wee timidus whisper, stricken with uncertain pitching. But here's what's really curious about Barbara. When she left Scotland, she chose to find somewhere sunny and warm to live, as would most anyone. But instead of California or Australia or Paraguay, she chose South Africa. It's little wonder that she wasn't capable of making a worldwide breakthrough or even a consistent string of hits operating out of a country under international sanctions. But what makes it more remarkable is that RCA Australia got away with licensing the record and releasing it without causing uproar and opprobrium, let alone spend three weeks at number one, as this record did, slipping to number two this week. Well, that's 2,000 words said on number 10 to number two. Let's see what can be said about our number one, which we will summon with the thunderous drums of the one and only Gene. Take it away, Gene. It's never, never, never by Shirley Bassey, which reached the peak for the first of its five weeks this week. In a week where the easy listening or countropolitan sounds dominated the charts, this is at least that music as practiced by one of its consummate ambassadors. Peerless was Shirley Bassey. Filled with her inimitable sense of drama, clipped chilly phrasing, and an excellent proto-disco bass line, it's very probably the rightful best of a pretty sorry bunch this week. The mum and dad pop theme dominated the charts right up until almost the end of September, when with most of these acts still high on the charts, Susie Quattro plowed it alone, furrowed a number one with the magnificent Can the Can, and a fresh crop of rockers started to enter the top 20. But just why the third quarter of 1973 should have been dominated by so completely forgettable easy listening is beyond my ken to calculate. What say you? In any case, thus ends the ballad of 3rd of August 1973. All that remains is to thank you for persevering with it. Feel free to leave a comment which I would adore, or a like, or a substitute, and I will depart with my assurance that we shall meet again, perhaps in cheerier climes, in the fields of the past, that most foreign of countries.